Spider-Man. Arguably one of the most recognizable comic book characters in the world. Created in 1962, after Stan Lee had created the Incredible Hulk, he had been inspired to create a character that could crawl on walls after he'd seen a fly crawling the wall. He wanted something that was half man, half spider. The origin of Spider-Man first appeared in Amazing Fantasy 15 on June 5, 1962. We were introduced to the titular character named Peter Parker that was an orphan living with his Aunt May and Uncle Ben. On a school field trip, he is bitten by a radioactive spider and took on powers of a spider proportionate to a human. By this point, Spider-Man had been featured in 40 years worth of comic book stories, numerous animated series, and probably the most notable and with critical acclaim was the 90s animated series that had Christopher Daniel Barnes, who some of you may know better as Prince Eric from 1989's The Little Mermaid, voicing Spider-Man Peter Parker. And to this day, he is considered one of the most quintessential voices of the webhead with his sarcastic and witty delivery. <gasps> huh? Two of them! Congratulations, you can count! And they say the school system's failing. There had been Spider-Man movies before, from Spider-Man in 1977, Spider-Man Strikes Back, and Spider-Man The Dragon's Challenge. These were made-for-TV movies with them being released theatrically outside of the US. There had been an attempt to bring Spider-Man to the big screen as far back as 1985 with numerous rewrites under canon films that would have seen a college-aged Parker having Otto Octavius as a teacher or mentor figure. The project fell through and it wouldn't be until 1994 where Karoko Pictures and MGM would bring in James Cameron to make a treatment where Spidey would have been played by Leonardo DiCaprio and having Arnold Schwarzenegger playing Doc Ock. The project went nowhere and it wasn't until Marvel licensed the character to Columbia that Spider-Man finally went into production. So, after the likes of Batman and Superman had their turn at the box office, all eyes turned to Marvel and Columbia's first big screen adaptation of the webhead. After 20 years, does it still hold up? Let's find out as we revisit Spider-Man. This was a monumental event back in 2002. After four Superman and Batman movies each, from the late 70s to the late 90s, Marvel were slowly starting to come into their own with the release of Blade in 98, then X-Men in 2000, with Sir Patrick Stewart leading the way as the first live-action Professor Charles Xavier. If Batman is DC's crowned jewel, then the same could be said for Spidey for Marvel. I think people gravitate towards Spidey is because he's the everyman. He represents what we could do if we were given these powers by accident. And this is something that really hits home for Parker after his uncle's funeral. Because you remember what his Uncle Ben taught him. What I like that the movie does, it shows a montage of Parker fighting crime as Spider-Man to show that he's building a reputation where people's opinions are... divided. There are those that appreciate what he does, and then there's this clown. He stinks, and I don't like him. Most people know in the comics and the various animated series over a four decade period will know that Spidey creates webs via his web shooters with web fluid he developed. In this, however, his powers are organic. Wholesale. He has organic web shooters where his body has a gland that produces his webbing organically. Around the time that most studios were going for a realistic approach and director Sam Raimi opted to make his shooters grown in his body. The pacing is fluid even with no action scenes. And the movie wastes no time with Parker narrating that this movie is about Mary Jane. I found this a little weird because I think the movie is about Parker coming to terms that there are consequences of him being Spider-Man even though he's helping the innocent and remembering what his uncle taught him about responsibility. You can clearly see in Peter's eyes when MJ confesses her love for him that he's so conflicted that he so badly wants to be with her but he knows what that comes with. That would compromise him if criminals knew who he was and who he was close to. It's movies like this that teaches the importance of being a loner so that none of your friends and loved ones can come to harm. Just look at Batman. There's a reason why in the majority of the comics, shows and movies 
he stays a loner with the exceptions of James Gordon and Alfred as his allies and confidants. I think the ending scene could have been better written to where it should have stayed consistent in Mary Jane's hand still being on Parker's cheek when the camera is on her, and then it goes to Parker and her hand is down, and then vice versa. I couldn't go throughout this movie without talking about the character that arguably stole the show. J. Jonah Jameson. In pretty much every incarnation of Spider-Man over the 40 years before this movie, he was the comic relief and that gruff potty mouth that would try to paint this unflattering image of Spidey as a criminal menace. Jameson debatably has the best material of him ranting over Spider-Man's image and then realizing he can make money out of this when Robbie Robertson says that they sold out four printings. We sold out four printings. Sold out? Every copy. When you have JK's witty and charismatic delivery as the character, it's not hard to see why fans love the character and why Simmons loves playing him. For me, the best highlight of the movie is easily the bridge battle, where he not only saves a rail car of children, but he saves Mary Jane from falling into the river. And the way that Danny Elfman scored this scene when Goblin said he'd kill MJ nice and slow is just powerful. Twenty years later, this movie remains a standard bearer of how you introduce a beloved character to the big screen. The first actor to portray the wall crawler in a big budgeted picture. What I like about Toby's performance as Parker is his ability to show the quiet and shy nature of the orphan teen that lives with his aunt and uncle. He tends to be more vocal around James Franco's Harry Osborn, whereas around Kirsten Dunst's Mary Jane Watson, he tends to clam up. I think that's natural. I think if you're a quiet teen and you see the girl of your dreams, you do tend to clam up. And also Mary Jane's a redhead, so that's automatically a win. He conveys the weight of guilt on his shoulders well as realizing that if he had stopped the robber, he would have prevented his uncle's murder. That and remembering what he taught him. Whatever life holds in store for me, I will never forget these words. With great power comes great responsibility. Peter Parker is Spider-Man because of his Uncle Ben. Surprisingly, my biggest critique with Maguire is as Spider-Man. Now, in the comics and cartoon history, Spidey is known for cracking jokes. It's part of a facade that he also wears as a mask to hide his feelings. In this, he cracked two jokes. One against Goblin. It's you who's out, Gobby. Out of your mind. This one in a cage match against Bonesaw McGraw, played by the late Macho Man Randy Savage. That's a cute outfit. Did your husband give it to you? Oh, that has really not aged well. What we need to remember is that line was written around a different time where it was seen as socially acceptable. Whereas today, ooh, no, you can get canned for that. Let's put it like this. If it were being written today, the line would be more like, hey, that's a cute outfit. Did you get it at a wrestling reject store? Now as to whether that's comedic, that's up for debate, but for all those concerned, it would be seen as okay. I think had Maguire been given more comedic material to work with, it might have been a more balanced performance. Willem Dafoe is to the Green Goblin as Jack Nicholson was to the Joker, losing themselves in the role and being completely ham about it. But taking into consideration that these characters have had a long history as these colourful and charismatic figures, it only makes sense that you cast actors to do the parts justice. I've said this so many times down the years that I've lost count. You can tell when an actor is enjoying their work when they lose themselves in the role and are enjoying it way too much. And to this. Itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout. Okay, uh, point to order, when someone smiles like that, chances are they're not acting. In Spidey's 60 year existence as a character, people know he's had two main love interests in the comics, Gwen Stacy and the more well-known interest, Mary Jane Watson. 
In terms of appearances, Kirsten had the right look as the girl next door with the red hair and I think most guys were smitten with her back then. Acting wise... Okay, how honest do you want me to be? What we have here is a Megan Fox situation. If the material is catered to her capabilities, then it's fine. And for the most part, her acting is... passable. It's nothing to write home about. It's certainly nothing compared to Emma Stone's performance as Gwen Stacy a decade later. But I'll get to that next year. Sadly, this was her best performance as MJ. Not to be confused with me. Her performance would continue to get worse in the sequels, especially Spider-Man 3. The first major live-action actor to portray the figure to instill a strong sense of responsibility to Peter, unknowingly that this would serve his nephew well as a vigilante. The late Cliff has a warm presence and a great father figure in the absence of his real father, as that aspect of the story was never touched upon in this iteration. Probably what many consider the most iconic portrayal of Peter Parker's auntie. Rosemary displays a lot of warmth and guidance to her young nephew in the loss of her husband and his uncle. In a weird way, she continues the role as the moral compass figure that Ben was and offers Peter advice when he's looking for answers, and even tells him what everyone else already knows, particularly about Mary Jane. She would reprise her role two more times where she would act as a pivotal figure for Peter and his alter ego. I think he was one of the weaker performances. I don't know what it was, but it just seemed like he wasn't invested in what he was doing or he was just phoning it in. He would actually put in better performances as the sequels rolled in, Spider-Man 3 arguably being his best performance. The only time in Spider-Man 1 where he shows any conviction is where he thinks Spidey has killed his father. And the one that stole the show. Even from Tobey Maguire. Like Defoe, Simmons loses himself in the role as JJ. He looked the part the moment his reveal happens in the editor's office of the Daily Bugle where you can see his two-tone flat top haircut along with the iconic mustache that dates back to the original comics and the subsequent animated series. The 1994 animated series, arguably the most iconic, with the late Edward Asner being the voice of JJ. It's said that he found out through a kid waiting with him at the bus stop that he got the role of J. Jonah Jameson before the studio even called him. Well, that's not a bad way of finding out. I find his best quotes from the movie are... Who is Spider-Man? He's a criminal, that's who he is. And... Oh, what, is he shy? We can get a picture of Julia Roberts in a thong, we can certainly get a picture of this weirdo. He doesn't want to be famous, and I'll make him infamous. J.K. loves the character that much that he reprised it many times from animated series like The Avengers, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, Ultimate Spider-Man, and to even a cameo as J.J. in The Simpsons. He would reprise the role two more times in the Sam Raimi series before returning in the MCU Spider-Man Far From Home as a painfully obvious pun on Alex Jones. Subtle. And thy name is Marvel. This is the part where I'm not going to hold back. As good as the special effects are, some of the visual effects have not aged so well. When you look at the Green Goblin exiting the parade, the CG used for him on his glider doesn't look tangible. Also, the costume just looks like it was molded after the Green Ranger. If Hayam Saban actually spent money on the costumes, what he said. Another major critique I have is with Spidey's costume, more specifically the mask. Now here's the thing, the mask is comic book accurate. What I find jarring is that whenever he would talk, the chin is not interacting with the mask and that can take you out of the story. I'm glad 14 years later, when Tom Holland made his MCU debut as a younger Spider-Man, you actually see the chin portion of the mask interact when he speaks. However, the web-swinging scenes still look great to this day, from when you see him swinging after his uncle's killer and to various scenes when he has the costume. There is one shot of the Twin Towers reflected in his visor even though they had fallen down a year prior because of 9-11. Why the decision was left to keep them in, I don't know. I know that they were still filming the movie when the tragedy happened and were even included in the original theatrical trailer of a helicopter of robbers getting caught in his web between the buildings. 
As a visual effect, the webbing still looks great to this day, even when it made a return in Spider-Man No Way Home. So, 20 years later, the effects are hit and miss. They're a product of their time. But via the same token, they can take you out of the moment. Say what we will about Danny Elfman. And Lord knows I've sassed him plenty in other movies. What he did for the score of this movie has a very grand and majestic feel from the opening score, Spidey swinging to the bridge, and as mentioned earlier, his final moments with the Green Goblin. Some of the more tender moments are when we see these moments with Peter and MJ slowly beginning to create chemistry with each other, of which one somewhat romantic moment shows a romantic bonding between them whilst Mary Jane is visiting Aunt May with him. And the same can be said with this scene. Folks, don't lie. You've all dreamed about doing that. When Elfman is not trying to be rinse and repeat, he is able to make the score a storytelling piece to where it complements and elevates the scene. The only composer that matched Elfman for a decent Spider-Man score was James Horner a decade later with The Amazing Spider-Man. Chad Kruger and Josie Scott of Nickelback and Saliva, respectively, performed arguably the most popular number on the soundtrack with Hero. Aerosmith even did a rock and roll version of the 60s TV theme. Suffice to say, the score is just as iconic as the story. Spider-Man grossed a profit of $825 million off a budget of $139 million. 20 years of inflation later, and the movie's total would be $1.3 billion. It took in $114 million on its opening weekend, making it the first movie ever to do so on its opening weekend. It held the record for highest grossing superhero origin film until the 2017 release of DC's Wonder Woman. Entertainment Weekly put The Kiss in Spider-Man on its end of the decade best of list, saying, there's a fine line between romantic and corny, and the rain-soaked smooch between Spider-Man and Mary Jane from 2002 tap dances right on that line. The reason it works? Even if she suspects he's Peter Parker, she doesn't try to find out. And that's sexy. USA Today critic Mike Clark believed the casting of Tobey Maguire rivaled that of Christopher Reeve as 1978 Superman. As no one really knew who Reeve was before Superman and is still considered the quintessential performance. And people feel the same about Toby as Spidey. There was some criticism. IGN's Richard George had this to say. We're not saying the comic book costume is exactly thrilling, but the goblin armor, the helmet in particular from Spider-Man, is almost comically bad. Not only is it not frightening, it prohibits expression. You know it's cold somewhere when I agree with IGN. Spider-Man would spawn two sequels in 2004's Spider-Man 2, which is considered one of the best sequels as well as one of the best superhero movies of all time, and 2007's Spider-Man 3, which is still very divisive to this day with regards to plot, acting, and in some cases, character assassination. And the less we say about this scene, the better. <laughs> a CG animated series followed from MTV and Mainframe Studios, the same company that gave us the 90s series Reboot and Beast Wars. With Neil Patrick Harris as Spidey, Ian Ziering as Harry Osborn, and Lisa Loeb as Mary Jane Watson. There was supposed to be a fourth Spider-Man movie with Tobey Maguire set to go, but then the project was cancelled when Sam Raimi withdrew from it. The series was then rebooted for 2012's The Amazing Spider-Man, with Andrew Garfield replacing Tobey Maguire as Peter Parker. A sequel followed in 2014's The Amazing Spider-Man 2, of which the movie was panned by fans and critics to such a degree that it made Spider-Man 3 look like a masterpiece by comparison. Ouch. Way to goof that one up. After a fallout between Sony and Garfield, as there was talk of bringing Garfield into the MCU as Spider-Man, Tom Holland became only the third man this century to play Peter Parker Spider-Man in live action when he debuted in Captain America 3 Civil War. 
Holland would appear as Parker five more times in Spider-Man Homecoming, Avengers 3 Infinity War, Avengers 4 Endgame, Spider-Man Far From Home, and appearing in Spider-Man No Way Home, in which he stood beside former Spider-Man in Andrew Garfield and the OG himself, Tobey Maguire. The movie has been enjoyed on VHS, DVD, Blu-ray, and 4K since 2002. I'm MJ Knight, and this was Spider-Man. Pizza time will happen in the sequel. <laughs>